The candidates are going to be given uh, time in a, few, in a couple of minutes to introduce themselves, but first of all, I'd like to give you uh, a few comments about our debate tonight. I was at the climate strike rally on Friday, last Friday, and the young people there had a whole long list of things uh, as to how we were to behave while we were there. But short and simple for tonight, we are asking you to maintain this as a civic debate. Uh, here in the sanctuary, we sometimes talk about holy manners. So we are asking that you acknowledge the candidates, that you listen respectfully. Uh, we would prefer that you hold your applause. I know sometimes that's hard to do if you particularly agree with something. Uh, but in particular, we would ask you to make sure that you are not jeering or making uh, negative sounds when candidates are here. They have committed to being candidates in this debate, and we need to honor the positions that they take and the fact that they have put themselves forward as candidates. Um, the, um, any person who feels that they really have to say what they think is invited to take it outside and say what they think. Um, there are emergency exits uh, at the back and also here at the front if needed. Um, and audience members are being invited. There were questions when you came in. There were question cards. Perhaps you didn't see them. If you missed them, we have a couple of folks walking, wandering around with those cards because each candidate has received seven questions that they are going to be asked to respond to. Uh, and following those seven questions, then we will take what we're calling a composite of questions that have come in, because there have been many questions. So we have a group that are going to try and take all the questions you've brought us, and for the next several minutes, we'll collect any more that you have, and they're going to try and boil it down into two or three questions that will then be put to the candidates. They will not know in advance what those questions are. There's one other added feature tonight, which is rebuttal cards. Each candidate has been given two. And so after each question has been asked and answered, I am going to ask if any candidate wants to use one of their two rebuttal cards. And if they really feel there's something that's been said that they need to respond to, they'll have a couple of minutes to respond as a rebuttal. So I think we are, uh, we are ready to begin, and they have drawn the order in which they're going to be speaking tonight. So the first person who's going to be speaking, and he's going to have uh, one minute, and our timekeeper's here. Do you want to just show the cards for us? There's a second, 30 second card, and then a stop. And our first speaker tonight is going to be Marty Lancaster. <coughs> Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Marty Lancaster, and uh, I'm representing the Green Party. And one of our main efforts in this election is to uh, bring status quo relief, which is to change the channel from the noise, which is to do politics better, which is to reach across party lines and change the way we do things. Our party has six core values that we make all of our decisions based on, all of our policies are based on, and they are ecological wisdom, sustainability, social justice, respect for diversity, nonviolence, participatory democracy. And those are the values that our party means to bring forward uh, into parliament and change the way we do government and do it better for the people, not for the parties. Thank you. Our next speaker, Brian Kelly Chiron. Thank you for having me here this evening. As mentioned, I'm Brian Kelly Tran. I'm the son of two hardworking parents who immigrated to Canada from England. And like many of you in this room, I am proud to call Barry my home. I want to start by making clear I am not a politician, and I do not apologize for this. I've been a dental surgeon, business owner, volunteer, and educator, all in this community. I love this place. I want to give back to my neighbors, this community, and this country, which welcome my family with open arms. I know and I've heard that what is most important to you is our environment and making our, our community stronger. This election, I want you to choose to elect the MP who will have your voice in government. 
someone who cares about the climate and is taking action. Thank you. And Doug Shipley. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. My name is Doug Shipley. I'm running for the Conservative Party for the riding of Barry Springwater Ormanande. It truly is a pleasure to be here tonight. It's a pleasure to look out over such a great crowd. This truly is democracy at work here in the city of Barrie. So thank you to all you people for coming out and taking the time out of your day. This is important. It's an important election. I have been a Barrie City Councillor for the past three terms, nine years, and I'm proud of the work I've done and who I've represented and how I've worked on City Council. I've also run my own company for over 20 years, so I think I have a nice political and business acumen to go together. This is an important election. This election is about making choices about the future of Canada and where we want to be and what type of future we want, what type of Canada we want to leave to our children. Uh, the economy is very important. We're getting overburdened with debt right now and we need to get that worked out. We need to leave a, a good, solid foundation for our children going forward. Thank you very much. I'm Dan Jensen. First, I want to say thank you to all the organizers and volunteers for hosting us tonight. And thank you all for joining us here for this important discussion. I know that people here are worried about serious issues. The climate crisis is frightening and it can seem overwhelming. People are facing racism and rising inequality. Life is getting more expensive and wages aren't keeping up. I'm hearing from people that life is getting more expensive and we, sorry, wages aren't keeping up. I'm hearing from people who feel that the very richest and the biggest corporations should pay more so that the rest of us aren't falling behind. We've had consecutive governments in Ottawa that haven't lived up to their promises. They haven't worked for you, but they've been working for their big business buddies and their lobbyists. I'm here because I'm ready to work hard for this community. I'm ready to fight for a Green New Deal that leaves no one behind, that tackles poverty, improves the public services we rely on, brings in head-to-toe health care, and takes bold action on the big issues big global issues that we're all facing. By sending me to Ottawa, I can promise you that we will elect someone that is always working for people on your side. Thank you. And finally, David Patterson. Thank you. I want to thank the organizers for the invitation. I want to thank you all for being here. I'm David Patterson, your People's Party candidate. The People's Party is the fastest growing party in Canadian history because Canadians want change. And the People's Party is doing politics differently. The People's Party will not waste your money and corrupt our democracy by giving handouts and special treatment to powerful companies, lobby groups, special interests, and media organizations. We are not a party of the powerful. We are a party of public service. Our party can only succeed, and we can only succeed as a country when ordinary Canadians like you and me become informed and involved in our governments and in our communities. I welcome the opportunity to introduce the People's <coughs> Party of Canada, our policies and our principles. I encourage you to research our party, the other parties and the topics we will discuss here today and to vote for what you believe in. Thank you. Okay. Our first question is on climate change. Around the world, we are seeing inspiring examples of leadership to reduce greenhouse gas pollution and accelerate the shift to the green economy. At the same time, we are seeing a ramp up of the effects of climate change, and the scientific consensus is that we have little more than a decade to turn things around. We see ex extreme weather events across the country, including wildfires, flooding, and drought. Per person, Canadians produce the most greenhouse, greenhouse gas pollution of all G20 industrialized nations, nearly three times the G20 average and over 20 tons per person. And so the first question, and we'll ask it to be put up, what are the key elements of an action plan that you will ad advocate for to ensure Canada meets its international obligations to reduce greenhouse gas pollution. Candidates are going to be given one and a half minutes each, and we're going to be starting this time with Brian as our first speaker. Canadians know that climate change is real. Young people all across this country have marched in the last few weeks to raise awareness. 
If elected, I will make the environment the main focus of my work as an MP. Climate activists agree that putting a price on pollution is the best way to get people's attention. As your MP, I will fight to keep and expand our <coughs> price on pollution. I want to lobby the Minister of Transport and, and Environment on stronger fuel standards. <coughs> I want to work with Health Canada and agriculture to incentivize and make sure that we have proper greenhouse gas neutral farms. I want to work with the Ministry of Infrastructure on better planning and construction in order to reduce urban sprawl and increase public transportation. Residents should choose a party that believes climate change is real and that the future of our planet is at risk. Put a price on pollution, invest in renewables to get 90% of electricity by 2030. That's what we're doing. Making zero emission vehicles more affordable and accessible, and a net zero emissions future by 2050. Thank you. Thank you. It's a real pleasure this time in this election to, to know that there's finally some consensus on, on climate change. It is a real issue. Uh, what the difference is, is uh, to most of the parties, to what the real issue is, is how do we get there? So I want to applaud, especially Marty Lancaster, who's really taking the lead on this. Marty spent some time with me. We've talked a little bit about this, and he has a lot of knowledge. Uh, but we've done our work, too, as a Conservative Party. We have put together a 60-page plan. It's a real plan to protect our environment. The Conservatives are completely on board that the climate is in crisis. What we just disagree on is how we're going to get there. So uh, it, it's encouraging this time that at least everybody's on the same page and knowing it's an issue, and we got to get through it. Uh, our plan is threefold uh, to start off with. Number one is we're going to have a green technology, not taxes. We believe in a cleaner and greener natural environment. And number three is taking the climate change fight globally. One of the issues is uh, we are dependent on fossil fuels in Canada. Right now there's 1.5 million jobs uh, in Canada that are dependent on it. That's not just something we're going to be able to turn off overnight. We need to make sure when we're doing this, we're doing it properly, we're doing it slowly. Canada is one of the... Uh, smallest emitters in the world for this, compared to some of the larger countries. Um, we need to make sure we're doing technology, we're gonna be providing some incentives for companies to make green technology, and we're gonna go globally and help the world solve this problem. We're not just gonna solve it here in Canada on our backs. So we definitely believe it's a big issue. We do have a large plan to try and help it. Where we're disagreeing is just however we get there, but our plan is definitely thorough. Thank you. I believe that Canada needs to do much more than just meet our international obligations. And we need to do more than what we've seen by our previous governments, which has basically been the bare minimum. The bare minimum wasn't good enough 10 years ago, and it's not good enough now. Our climate plan is strong enough to meet Canada's obligations while putting communities and families at the heart of our work. Science, not politics, must guide our actions. So I'm committing to pushing for science-based targets that will ensure global temperatures do not rise more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. We'll even put in a climate accountability office to ensure that our targets are met. The NDP is the only, tar the only party that can mobilize groups such as workers and labor organizations who will be critical to our success. Mobilizing people and groups needed in order to do what needs to be done. We need to tackle the climate crisis right alongside other crises like rising inequality and racism. That's why I'm so glad that housing and poverty are included in tonight's event. We need a Green New Deal. The status quo isn't good enough, and the parties that represent the status quo can't provide the answers our world needs right now. We need bold action, massive investments in clean energy and technology, and we need real wealth distribution that narrows the gap between the rich and the rest of us. Thank you. The current Liberal government recently declared a climate emergency, but they have implemented no programs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions except for a four cent per litre tax on gasoline that they introduced just this year. This is not what you would expect from a government that believes there is a climate emergency. 
They also won't tell you what level of greenhouse gas emissions reductions they expect from this policy or how much they expect it to improve the environment. Greenhouse gas emissions actually increased in 2017 for the first time in several years. Listen very carefully to what the other parties tell you about their greenhouse gas reduction programs and see if they make any specific promise about measurable reductions. A People's Party government will eliminate the dishonest and ineffective carbon tax. I am very hopeful about the future. We are on the threshold of a massive transition to clean energy with electric cars, solar and wind power, stationary battery storage, and even hyperloop transportation. The private sector worldwide is putting hundreds of billions of dollars into these new technologies. A People's Party government will stimulate investment in the private sector by reducing the business tax from 15 to 10% and by eliminating the capital gains tax. We need to get out of the way of private enterprise so that thousands of creative and innovative Canadians can do what's needed to move us away from a carbon-based economy while creating jobs and reducing consumer prices. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is a very important issue for me and for everyone. This is um, what this election should be about. We need to deal with a worldwide crisis on climate and it, we need to follow the scientists lead who give us specific targets and those are the targets that our party matches. The reduction in carbon needs to happen for 30 years and more. We have known about this. We made promises in the 90s. We made promises for Kyoto. We've made promises, promises, and every day our emissions have gone up. We are not getting the job done, and it's the parties that have been there for too long that are stuck and just can't seem to move forward. Key uh, elements of action are saying no to new pipelines, whether bitumen, or natural gas that you do not solve climate change by increasing the amount of fossil fuels that you are shipping to other countries and then blaming them for the problem. That is not how you get it done. I will uh, point back out to Doug Shipley that he does have uh, a couple of good points in his uh, green plan. The innovation of environmental stuff is important. They do not have any targets for the climate uh, reaching those goals and that's where we need to work together. When we get there, everybody needs to put their ideas on the table. And we heard some really good ideas from everybody here and they need a leadership to take them to that point that we actually create a Canadian policy to go forward, not a party policy, a Canadian one that we will continue and maintain and agree upon because everybody gets input and we need enough greens there to force that collaboration to happen, to get the job done on climate, and on all the other things we need to do. This is a very important issue. There are many ways to get there. We don't have to pick a particular one. You just have to unleash the green economy. Just let it go, get out of its way, stop giving billions to the oil industry and start incentivizing any industry that wants to go forward. And that's how you get it done. <clears throat> Does anyone want to use a rebuttal card? Okay, pass it in. I'm going to use one too. I have two rebuttal cards that have been handed in. Um, so if you want to start, Dan. Sure, I just want to. And the rebuttal is two minutes. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's issue it or not, but I think uh, right off the bat, Marty brings up a good point, and that's working together. And our parties need to come together in government so that we can tackle issues like climate change. And I know that our government, uh, if elected, we will be putting in proportional representation for the very next election. And that will mean that our parties have to Into those two minutes. I also found it very inspiring to be marching alongside so many young people last week. Um, I know that uh, young people care about our future, and I know that all of us do. We're stewards of the land. We want to make sure that future generations uh, have access to the to the uh, environment that we've all had. Um, I've been hearing news that uh, council, city council, may be declaring a climate emergency. I think that's very encouraging. 
I think we as a city should be taking this uh, this serious. And I know that the NDP will be creating an invest climate investment bank that will help municipalities switch their the vehicles that they use to electric vehicles as well as their busing and move towards free and accessible transit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, not so much a rebuttal as a, a story. I was here four years ago arguing very adamantly against Stephen Harper's uh, efforts to cancel our understanding, to get rid of uh, our scientists, to get rid of our knowledge, our, our long form census, all of that. And a little bit you need to know is, did Justin Trudeau buy a pipeline back in May 2018? Or did Stephen Harper do a FIPA, a trade agreement with China, to allow their companies to sue us privately because their companies own our oil in our ground and they are allowed right now to sue us secretly if anything gets in the way of their oil getting to market. So did Stephen Harper make this deal in private without a vote or did Justin Trudeau, while he was trying to work with the Chinese, just realize I better buy it for them before they sue us we wouldn't know because it's in secret. What this arrangement means is that we have to work for them. We have to listen to them. Their companies, their state-owned companies, can sue our government in private. This is a FIPA agreement that has been written back in 2014. And what it means is our rights, our water rights, our <clears throat> municipal rights, our indigenous rights are trampled by this deal and they can sue us if any of that gets in the way. And what does it mean? We're arresting our own people to protect a pipeline that's not owned by us. We have to wake up to what's actually happening, what's really going on behind the scenes. So it's not a, a rebuttal, this is a reality check as to what's really going on. And that's where you gotta get your minds around. This is not a fluffy discussion. This is a serious, <laughs> serious issue. And if you're gonna solve climate change, you gotta dig into these trade agreements that are bigger than <coughs> the statement we make today. So just bring in some awareness to this conversation. Thank you. I just want to just check that if anyone has a question from the audience that they want to put in, we're getting to the point where the group needs to put the questions together and prepare them for us. So I have a couple of volunteers walking around. If anyone had a question, please put your name up so they, they can collect the sheet from you or hand you one, and at the end of the next question, that'll be the cutoff for any questions that you want to, that you want to put in from the audience. Just keep your hand up and they will find you. And if you're writing the question, put your hand up when it's done, they'll come back and get it from you. Let's just go back to question two. <laughs> Many Canadians know that our country has the longest coastline in the world. Well known, less well known is that Canada is home to roughly half of the world's lakes and roughly 10% of the world's wetlands. Canada is seeing the impact that industrial and residential development and climate change is having on our water resources. We are seeing the reemergence of pollution hotspots like Lake Erie and our own Lake Simcoe is struggling. The Insurance Bureau of Canada notes that since the 1970s, there has been a massive 250% increase in natural disasters, including floods and drought, that are likely related to climate change. And so the question for the candidates tonight is this. What should the federal government do to reduce water pollution, increase water conservation, and reduce the risk of flood events, which have been aggravated by industrial development and climate change? Again, each candidate will have one and a half minutes, and we'll start with Doug. Thank you. It's really astounding that in this day and age that we're having to discuss potable water. Uh, in Canada, we take it so for granted, especially here in Barrie. I turn my, on my tap at home every day, and I drink out of tap water, and I always tell people we have some of the best tap water, some of the best water, purest water, and, and that's hard to believe that that's a luxury to some people. But uh, being a city councillor in Barrie for the last many years, I'm well aware that you know, we have the ability here to keep good potable water. But there are many places around uh, Canada that don't have that luxury. It astounds me that there's some First Nations uh, 
areas that have to have boil water. That needs to stop. We need to get on top of that and make sure that those people, everybody, every Canadian has good potable drinking water. This is a two-part question. The second part is also got to do with the, the Lake Simcoe Cleanup Fund. Back in 2007, under the Harper government, the Lake Simcoe Cleanup Fund was started. It was making great headway for many years. It was being funded to, to $30 million over that time period. Uh, it was removed in uh, 2017 by the current Liberal government. Uh, we will bring it back. Lake Simcoe is extremely important to this area, not just for the health, but also for the economy of this area, uh, to keep it going. So we will bring that back to Lake Simcoe and clean up. The third part of this section is about urban sprawl and industrial development. We need to start making cities smarter. We need to start building up, not out. And I think an example of that is obviously here in Barrie. Uh, I'm seeing some other councils here today, so probably not their head. We have definitely tried to do that over the last many years with a lot of pushback, but we're still doing it. We need to intensify even more and stop growing out to, to stop uh, urban sprawl. Thank you. <clears throat> well, we're incredibly lucky to be one of the countries with the most fresh water on the planet. Here, even at the north end of our riding, we've got the cleanest water in the world that flows out of the Elmville Flow uh, and the Alston Aquifer. We need to make sure that we're wise stewards of this precious resource for a long time. As a labor rep and an activist, I know what it's like to speak up for the voiceless. And I want to say thank you to all the environmental act activists that are out there fighting every single day to protect our environment. Everyone in our area knows that freshwater resources are not only critical to our ecosystems, but also critical to who we are as people. It's time to think of freshwater more broadly than the governments have in the past. The NDP will bring in a national freshwater strategy and work with the province of Ontario to protect our lakes, rivers, and our aquifers. We'll recognize Canadians' right to a healthy environment and enshrining it in law and create an environmental bill of rights to make sure everyone can enjoy clean access to water, air, and land. One thing I will do personally is advocate for citizen groups to make it easier for them to access funding for rehabilitation projects and public education. And I will also work with them to make sure that our policies and our strategies are implemented properly and that they are included in any implementation process. Thank you. In 2014, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change found that there was little or no evidence of an increase in the frequency or severity of droughts, floods, hurricanes, cyclones, heat waves, and other extreme weather events since the 1960s. We do not want to unnecessarily alarm people because fear and panic have negative psychological consequences, particularly for young people. I strongly disagree with efforts to promote a fearful agenda among our children. Let's debate this together as adults and deal with it as adults and not create unnecessary fear and anxiety which can lead to depression and even suicide in extreme cases. We need to be realistic or we won't solve anything. A People's Party government will promote implementing practical solutions to make Canada's air, water and soil cleaner, including bringing clean drinking water to remote First Nations communities. Lake Simcoe Watch has proposed that we work toward a reduction in phosphorus going into Lake Simcoe and that we continue the restoration of forests, wetlands, and meadows in the Lake Simcoe watershed. This will have practical benefits for the health and well-being of our residents and will restore natural habitat for fish, birds, and other wildlife. This is something that I will be happy to support and promote as your representative. Thank you. Creating a Lake Simcoe fund, um, well, the provincial government is gutting the conservation authorities, will be difficult to move forward if there's nobody to actually implement that fund. Um, and more importantly, if the temperature was up one and a half degrees, that cold water ecosystem fails. Doesn't matter how many dollars you throw in there, it fails. You have to solve climate change, you have to take care of the worst, the possible impacts if you're going to deal with protecting Lake Simcoe. So it's there's a it's a connected, right? It's all connected. So we have to do the effort. We don't put our heads in the sand and 
um, pretend nothing's happening. We deal with it head on, honestly and openly, and deal with these issues um, that need to be done. There are um, issues in this writing. There are recycling compost facilities being installed. There are aggregate pits being put in. There are developments in Horseshoe Valley that are going forward, all of which are not considering the water. They're not looking in the aquifers. They're not paying attention. And that is a major problem. And it's water first, people. Water first. And you prove you're not going to impact that water before you get a chance to go forward. You don't go, oh, soup, I did it after, and the, the water is all gone. That's not how we do our water. In, in Canada, we need to protect the water and think about it first. If you want to uh, deal with the um, flood risks, we have to imagine 100 year storms are now 10 year storms and deal with them and change our infrastructure to expect that stuff. Thank you. Like most people in Barry Spring or Ormodonte, I value and enjoy our lakes and waterways. We have made progress on reducing phosphate levels in Lake Simcoe. We need to reduce salt levels as well. As your MP, I will strongly advocate for the establishment of a successor program to the Lake Simcoe Cleanup Fund, which finished in 2017. I continue to support and advocate for the expansion of the Great Lakes Protection Plan to include Lake Simcoe. After all, all water is connected. I strongly support the Liberal government's Oceans Protection Plan, which is a single largest investment in Canadian history to protect our oceans. I support our party's plan to create a new Canada Water Agency. This agency will work together with provinces and territories, Indigenous communities, local authorities, scientists and others to keep our water safe, clean and well managed. Our lakes and rivers and streams can't wait any longer. We need to take action now. Thank you. For rebuttals, I have one from Doug. Anybody else wanting to use a rebuttal card? Okay, two minutes for rebuttal. Uh, well, thank you. This will be very short. And with all due respect to Brian's comment uh, about the Lake Simcoe Fund being finished, it was finished because the funding ended. Uh, the cleanup of Lake Simcoe was not done. The reason it finished because the money was removed and replaced somewhere else in, for lakes out west for locals held seats. That would be an, the analogy of being finished would be like me at City Council saying we have uh, snow plowing is finished forever. We're not going to put more money in the budget. So we're not plowing your roads this year because the budget is finished. That is just not what happened. It, it was finished because the funding was removed. So that would be the similar analogy. If you know we needed more cleanup, there could have been more money put into it the following year, but there was no money put back into it. Again, you like snow plowing and saying we're not going to put any money in to next year's budget for snow plowing because it's finished. It was not finished, it needed to continue. The third question, um, has everybody passed in any questions they have? Because the group is now going to put together what they can from the many questions that have come in. The next question that I'm going to put um, is around nature conservation. When asked about what they love most about our country, Canadians often point to natural beauty, wildlife, and spectacular wilderness areas. Yet we are falling below our international commitments to protect these spaces. A recent study shows that 50% of Canadian wildlife species are in decline. 87% of Canadians value the emotional and physical benefits of spending time in nature. However, 82% say that they're concerned that future generations won't have close or easy access to nature. And so the question is, what will you do to protect the quality and quantity of nature in Canada? And we'll start with Dan. 
one and a half minutes again. So are we started with Marty, that was the third question. Should we be done? No, I didn't. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, I guess. Um, I see. Okay. So just over 10% of Canada is, act is actively conserved. We have an incredible opportunity, but unfortunately the Liberals and the Conservatives haven't taken it. The <coughs> conservation targets the Liberals are aiming for aren't in line with what science shows we need to meet our goals and to protect animals and plants at risk of extinction. Conservatives have stood against protecting even what we have by opposing strengthening environmental assessments and gutted water protections when they were in government. Even here in the province, they're allowing de developers to pay a fee rather than uh, so that they can bypass the Environmental Protection Act. New Democrats will protect 30% of our land, fresh water, and oceans by 2030, and will back those protections with funding and enforcement. We'll protect biodiversity by using all federal tools under the Species at Risk Act, and we'll ensure the implementation of recovery strategies. We believe that every Canadian has the right to a healthy environment and clean water and air. That's why we'll bring in our Environmental Bill of Rights to make sure we enshrine that right into law. Earlier this spring, I was out for a walk with my daughter and my, and my partner, Carrie, and we came across the Freely Trap. Now, this is a piece of pristine forest that, uh, for some reason, the decision to put a waste diversion plant right in the middle of the forest instead of an industrial area. This is the type of decisions that we need to make sure we're not making. We need to protect those forests for future generations. Thank you. Thank you. The People's Party government will focus on conservation of nature and prevention and remediation of pollution. I will be a strong advocate within the party for increased protection and restoration of our natural environment. Farms use pesticides, herbicides, and chemical fertilizers. We need to protect the future of farming by encouraging practices which protect our environment. We also need to put more effort into protecting and restoring our natural forests and wetlands. We can do more by shifting our focus back to conservation and prevention of pollution rather than focusing on unrealistic short-term goals to reduce carbon emissions. A conservation policy will help to reduce the unnatural buildup of CO2 in our atmosphere because we will have more trees and more natural ground cover to, to absorb carbon dioxide. As your federal representative, I will work with local and provincial authorities to create a comprehensive protection and restoration program for our area. And I will work within our government to do the same for important sites across Canada. Thank you. Um, the Green Party dedicates 30% uh, of all oceans, freshwater, and land to be protected and set aside for nature one third of Canada, set aside, no go, protect it, leave it alone, let it be. That's what we need to do. We commit 100 million annually over the next four years to create indigenous led protected and conserved areas and fund stewardship of these lands and waters by indigenous guardians. And I can't help but bring up EC Jury at this moment. This place was a wasteland, EC Jury of the UFO party, United Farmers of Ontario, planted Simcoe County Forest, created the space we had today because they recognized the waste and the, the problem that we had here. We need people like that to see that vision and actually protect and improve our environment. So a um, bit of a hero for me, the, uh, the more research you do of him, the more you find how he had some really good leadership in this area. We need to respect that and get back to that level of pushing to fix problems and uh, plant trees. There you go. It's one of his uh, major accomplishments, Simcoe County Forest. You can directly be associated with one uh, farmer's effort in this area. So um, thanks to him and let's not put compost facilities right in the middle of those forests as they are here as our space. Um, one other thing would be great, pay some farmers to build some corridors, some uh, environmental corridors at the edge of their farm so that animals can move from Lake Simcoe to Copeland Forest to other parts of the world. Um, that's how you kind of connect ecosystems, right? You have to protect that too. Thank you.
enjoying nature is important to me. I often take my morning runs along Lake Simcoe. I will work with Natural Resources Canada and the Ministry of the Environment to protect and grow more of our precious natural landscapes. The Liberal government recognizes that experiencing and enjoying nature is important to our mental health. And that is why we will be establishing a national program so that every Canadian can learn how to camp and experience nature. I strongly support the Liberal promise to protect 25% of our oceans and forests in a natural state by 2025. As your MP, I will work to hold a Liberal government to this promise and advocate for other protections for Canadian nature. We invested $1.35 billion to protect more of Canada's land and wildlife, the largest investment in nature's conservation in our country. Nature has already created such a great solution to climate change. We need to support nature and the work it's doing to protect it from ourselves. Thank you. And once again, Marty, uh, believe it or not, we're on the same wavelength because a lot of our answer uh, locally was going to be based around the Simcoe Forest. Um, I also have a dog, we're tired of getting walking. And, and before the campaign started, I tried to go to the dog every day and take long, lengthy walks. We have a tremendous area locally. I know we're talking about Canada, but I'd like to talk locally. The Barry Springwater Orbitante is some of the best natural outdoor spaces that Canada has to offer. We have a very actual rural riding. Unlike uh, an interesting article I saw in the paper this week that said we were mainly urban uh, riding, I'd say 90% of our area is actually based out in the rural uh, area. Springwater Orbitante makes up the most of the uh, geography for our land. But Lake Simcoe is definitely the center of attention, and we will protect Lake Simcoe. But we can't forget about the menacing wetlands in our backyard. It's unbelievably beautiful. It's one of the largest wetlands in all of North America. We need to protect these two areas, and the Conservative government will ensure these are protected. In a lot of ways, I am optimistic, though, about our natural environment and what it will look like here. I agree with the uh, Simcoe Forest that our old pine plantations are giving way to the resurgence of the old hardwoods that are starting to come back, and it's fantastic to go out there and see what's going on. Uh, there's some great walking opportunities. It's at least encouraging. It's not done, it's not finished, but we're on the right path, but we need to continue on that. Uh, over the last 50 years, we've seen tremendous rebirth of our forests that are basically clear cuts. So we've been on that too, but it's really come back. Um, I think the County of Simcoe has been doing a great job, but we need to encourage that in bringing the hardwood trees back to the restore reforestation programs. These programs need to continue. Thank you. <laughs> Nobody wants to use up any of their precious rebuttal cards. <laughs> it's your choice. We've got two each. Okay, we're going to move on then to the uh, to the next question. Our next question is around envir environmental justice. If environmental justice embraces the principle that all people and communities are entitled to equal protection of environmental and public health laws and regulations, regardless of income, race, color, or national origin. However, what we see in Canada is environmental injustice, where there are still long-term boil water advisories across First Nation communities, communities whose life expectancy is worse than that of third world countries. In Ontario, Grassy Narrows, an indigenous community poisoned by mercury dumping, is still waiting for environmental cleanup and justice. Further changes in the Canadian climate will most greatly impact seniors, children, women, and those living in poverty. And so the question, how will your party address environmental injustices such as, as these so that the most vulnerable Canadians are not disproportionately burdened? And we're gonna start with David. Thank you. Some of the other political parties have released new policies throughout the election period. Policies that are full of minor tax breaks and handouts to buy votes while increasing our national debt. The People's Party has released most of its policy well before the election. 
So far, we have released only two policies during the election period. One of these is our policy on Aboriginal issues. This shows that we take Aboriginal issues seriously, and it shows our respect as a party for Canada's Aboriginal people. Our leader, Maxime Bernier, has said that if elected, one of his first priorities will be to address boil water issues in Indigenous communities across the country. It is not just grass and arrows. There are 56 boil water advisories which remain in place across Canada. And then there are communities like grass and arrows where boiling water won't solve the problem. Mineral <coughs> contamination, such as mer mercury, which is the problem at grass and arrows, cannot be broken down by boiling water. The People's Party of Canada will work on innovative solutions in cooperation with indigenous communities and will fix the inefficient government procurement systems which have resulted in delays and have put lives at risk. Thank you. <clears throat> um, the group that is most affected by environmental disasters is always the indigenous people and are downstream. They represent 5% of our population and they fight for 80% of the protection efforts that are made around the world for our clean water, for our land and our space, and we keep dumping stuff into their space every time. Grassy Narrows needs a medical center to help them with their, their uh, issues with the mercury poisoning they're experiencing that needs to be built today and funded with doctors today. Attawampuskat was promised a recreational facility because there's nothing for them to do up there four years ago, and they were promised it again just recently. These promises are not being fulfilled, and these people are struggling, vulnerable, disproportionately affected um, by our pollution. And we just dump it into their space and expect them to take it, and that's not uh, fair. We need to end drinking water and boil water advisories by investing and upgrading critical infrastructure to ensure safe water access in every community. We need an indigenous ombudsman for health. The Grassy Narrows community, I taught about this for years in my class, embarrassingly for years. The doctors were being ignored, they were showing up, they were showing signs. It takes forever for them to argue their case. They need to have massive numbers of cancer before anyone starts listening. We have to solve these problems. Downstream of the tar sands is another big issue. All of these things are easily dealt with ahead of time. We don't have to wait until people are struggling and dying and getting cancer and poisoning. It's wrong. Thank you. You're absolutely right. Our indigenous people and their knowledge are at the core of addressing and taking action on our climate change. I believe in our government's approach in incorporating indigenous people into our solutions. Over the last four years, we have focused on building a new relationship with indigenous peoples, one based on recognitions of rights respect, cooperation, and partnership. There are definitely inequalities that have not been addressed by previous governments. Lack of movement on reducing poverty, building houses, gender equality, or minor not minority rights. For the specific cases with grassy nations, I understand that the government has presented some solutions but because the chief is running in the election, discussions will be ongoing. Since elected, the Liberal government did help 87 First Nations improve their infrastructure and lift oil water advisories. A new relationship starts with trust. We said we would end oil water advisories, and we are on our way there. Thank you. Every Canadian must have access to potable water. We must take responsibility for this and ensure this positive outcome. There needs to be punishment for those who intentionally or unintentionally poison water. Our water is sacred and should be treated with absolute reverence. This includes immediately stopping certain jurisdictions from dumping raw sewage into rivers. And once again, talking about the issue of the First Nations, um, as a city councillor, we go through uh, water training uh, and we had a gentleman come and speak to us uh, not too long ago, and 
I had to ask the question, and I know Councillor Aylwin's here tonight, you will probably remember this too. Um, the gentleman who came to teach us had been to many, many areas of Canada uh, to help people get potable water. And I asked him, what is the root cause? What is going on? How do we make this better? And quite frankly, it was a, an interesting answer. It's not just a matter of throwing more money at it. He was actually saying what the problem is, is getting people to actually want to work there to help them to keep it clean. They're training some people and they're leaving the area. So we need to make sure that people are trained and are there to be able to keep the, the equipment running properly, just we are here in our uh, own Barry. So we need to look at other areas of helping them, but everybody must have potable water, and that's something we need to make sure is vital and the Conservative Party will stand behind that across Canada. Thank you. Well, first let me say that I'm thrilled that Chief Rudy Turtle of Grassy Narrows First Nation is running as an NDP candidate in this election. <laughs> I think that demonstrates our commitment and our priorities. I had the opportunity to speak with Chief Rudy Turtle at a recent NDP convention, and I can tell you that he is committed to improving this community. Environmental justice is racial justice, and we must use this opportunity to address inequality. That is fundamental to understanding the steps that we need to take. Government should be measured and judged by the relationship with many communities and nations that make up our country. The Liberals and the Conservatives have strained the relationship between government and Indigenous peoples. Things are so bad that the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal has had to order the government to equally fund Indigenous children seven times since 2016. We're committed to a true nation-to-nation -nation relationship, reconciliation, recognition of Indigenous rights, and equal funding. Under our plan, Indigenous communities can have safe housing, clean drinking water, access to health care, and quality education. We'll end the underfunding of Indigenous children's services and education, and unlike the Liberals, we'll invest what's needed to lift all drinking water advisories across the country by 2021. Thank you. Is there anyone wanting to use a bottle card? Okay, Marty and then Brian. Two minutes each. I, I mostly have to take exception uh, to the word incorporating uh, First Nations into the plan. That does not sound like free and prior consent, as is stated in the UNDRIP which is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, pushing pipelines through their properties without asking for treaties, and dealing with their meeting in a fair and nation-to-nation and -nation way is not how you uh, meet and work with First Nations people. It's not, um, as well as um, Andrew Shear's comments recently about, we will work with those, we will work with the ones that will work with us on, on projects, but you have to have that consent every single time. We have to learn our colonial past it is wrong and you can't just force, you can't incorporate. It will take us years to solve the Indian Act and work through a nation-to-nation -nation building process. It will take, we've committed to 10 years, but it will take a very long time with lots of work to do that. Incorporating is um, condescending and that is not how you need to have nation-to-nation -nation relations. Thank you. We speak about contamination of water. What's important to address is protecting Canadians overall from pollution and toxins. It is vital to our health, not just for this generation, for all of our communities, including our Indigenous people, and the generations to follow. Taking action now for pollution is unquestionable. Not just to look at what's going on for today's society, but to address us as a Canadian community in the future. I know our putting a ban on single plastic 
is a step in the right direction. This means, for example, less microplastics in our environment, water sources, and food systems, which benefits all communities, <coughs> especially our indigenous people. I support and believe in having strong legislation on the environment and listening to the voice of our indigenous people so we can learn and we can address and reform, for example, the Canadian Environment Protection Act. We have committed as a party, for example, to eliminate coal by 2030, which is going to affect positively our entire country by reducing mercury in the, our water. This will, this will positively impact our Canadian and our Indigenous communities. Thank you. to change the, the topics just a little bit now we're going to move to our next question which is on housing and the, the question there is no background on this one there's a question oops it's not all i'll read the first part if elected how would you and your party address the urgent need for affordable housing in barry springwater <coughs> oral mcgonty what definition does your party use for affordable housing and if that definition includes low to moderate income households, how do you define that term? And we're going to start with Marty. Again, one and a half minutes per candidate. <clears throat> this one I'm going to give to Phil. Phil I met on Bayfield Street um, as I was out door knocking. And uh, he go, I said, hey, how are you doing on the Green Party again? He goes, oh, I've been really meaning to talk to one of you politicians. and. Uh, I said, oh, where do you live? He says, well, I walk to the end of Bayfield Street, past your sign, and go find my tent, is where he lives. And uh, he was willing to talk to me for quite a while, and he explained to me, he said, it's 85 cents per square foot. I said, what? He says, that's how you calculate affordable housing, 85 cents per square foot. And I call it the fill factor now, and it is um, very clear, I've actually done the calculations. It makes sense. That is something people can afford, and you need to create housing in this city, and I believe for years we've been, allowed, been allowing condo developments to move their affordable housing units. I don't know where, but they're getting away with not building them, and we've gone away from that in Canada for the longest time and created a, a national crisis of affordable housing, but it can be solved, and I want to implement the fill factor in this, in this city. That is, if you're going to build 100 units, 20 of them have to be 85 cents a square foot available to those that need affordable housing. So I thank Phil, and uh, every time I see him, we, we talk, and he's getting out to vote. And that's hard for a homeless person to figure out how to vote in this city. And we, we, don't, uh, we have to pay attention to these people. They have great ideas, and they, they need our help. So we're going to fix this for Phil. deserve a safe and affordable place to call home. Housing prices and rent are one of the top issues that I'm hearing when I'm knocking door to door. I am constantly surprised when I knock at a single dwelling home to find multiple families or individuals living there. I am proud to be part of a team that has created Canada's first ever national housing strategy. A 10-year, $40 billion plan that will give Canadians a place to call home. Creating 100,000 new housing <coughs> units, four times more than our previous government did during their 10 years. We are also committed with working with our provinces and territories to develop a $4 billion Canadian Housing Benefit Plan to respond to local housing needs. We know having a home makes Canadians feel more secure, makes it easier to raise healthy children, pursue an education, 
and gain employment. We are addressing and have addressed our housing crisis. When it comes to affordable housing, one of the largest issues uh, we have is, quite frankly, an inventory issue. There's not enough inventory of rental or purchase properties out there. Uh, I agree with Marty that the rates would be great at that, Marty. One of the issues that I've seen for nine years on City Council now is we are constantly approving condos and apartments to be built, and then they sit uh, empty lots. And everybody's always asking, what's going on? Why don't those get built? And it's never being held, not never, sometimes it's being held up by council, but most times they've been approved. And the, quite frankly, the business case doesn't make sense. So the property sits empty and it's not being built. So we need to make sure that a new conservative government will work with the provinces and municipalities to knock down regulatory barriers that discourage new home construction so more homes can come on the market to lower prices. Conservative government will fix the mortgage stress test, making it easier to save for a down payment and help families get ahead. We will increase the mortgage amortization to 30 years. We definitely think, we definitely think, we know there's an issue with housing, but we need to make it more affordable and we need to make it more accessible, and that's a conservative plan. A major part of the long term solution to the problem is to ensure that more affordable rental units are built across our country. That's why a new Democrat government will create 500,000 units of quality, affordable housing in the next 10 years. Our federal investment will begin with $5 billion in additional funding over the next year and a half so that we can put shovels in the ground right away. And in order to kickstart construction of co-ops, social, and nonprofit housing, we will set up a dedicated fast start fund to get projects off the ground today not years from now. New Democrats will spear the construction of affordable homes by waiving the federal portion of the GST and HST on construction of new affordable rental units. It's a simple change that will help get units built faster and keep them affordable for the long term. We'll also need to make sure that families who are hurting right now get immediate relief through $5,000 rental subsidy for families who are struggling to afford rent. That's families paying more than 30% of their income to housing. And for people who want to buy a home, we'll double the home buyer's tax credit. We'll provide resources to facilitate co-housing, and we'll put in a foreign buyer's tax on the sale of homes to individuals that are not Canadian citizens or permanent residents. We'll also fight money laundering, and, which has been fueling organized crime, as well as driving up home prices. Thank you. Thank you. The only sustainable way to keep rents affordable is to increase the supply of new housing. By eliminating the capital gains tax, the People's Party will stimulate the construction of new housing. We also have a range of measures that will reduce consumer costs on groceries and telecommunications, which will leave more money in your pockets for rent and other necessities. Another way we will keep housing affordable is by making immigration to Canada more sustainable. Under the Liberals or the Conservatives, there will be three to four million new immigrants to Canada over the next 10 years. And 40% of immigrants move to Toronto or the Toronto area. That would be 1.2 to 1.6 million immigrants to this area in the next 10 years. This is driving up housing rents and reducing vacancy rates to near zero. Struggling Canadians must fill out applications and compete to find a place to live. Landlords discriminate against people who are on welfare or who have mental illness or addiction problems. Homeless people in Barrie only get a $400 allowance per month that allows them to rent a room infested with bed bugs and cockroaches. In the meantime, our welfare systems are overburdened with illegal immigrants and refugees, leaving inadequate resources to serve our homeless, our veterans, our homeless veterans, and our First Nations. A People's Party will rebalance these priorities in favor of providing increased services to Canadians in need. Thank you.
<clears throat> Are there any rebuttals to the question? Okay. There's one. Dan? Dan, you have two minutes. Sure. Um, I was fortunate uh, and honored to <coughs> run in the last provincial election, and uh, one of the things I learned a lot about uh, was sustainable development and uh, making sure that we're building where we already have communities, stopping urban sprawl. Uh, so while we build our affordable units, we need to make sure that they're built in a way that is sustainable in our, within our communities so that people have access to things like transit, uh, community centers, grocery stores nearby. Um, one other thing that I, uh, that I noticed uh, that was said was that we need to knock down regulatory barriers to building. You know, that sounds very familiar to what's happening in the province um, when, uh, when we're allowing developers to bypass environmental protections. We simply cannot be going that route. Uh, we do need regulations that protect people, the environment, and our land. Thank you. Our next question is uh, in the area of homelessness. And the, uh, the question, well, first of all, through the new National Housing Strategy Act, the Canadian government has committed to the progressive realization of the right to housing. And so the question is, are you and your party planning to prioritize vulnerable groups and those in greatest need of housing in your housing policy, recognize homelessness as a violation of human rights, and commit to ending homelessness in the shortest time possible? If yes, what is your strategy for accomplishing this goal? Again, one and a half minutes and we'll start with Brian. As one of the past chairs of Simcoe County's response team for homelessness, I am well aware and committed to our disenfranchised homeless community. As your MP, I will commit to working to end homelessness for the vulnerable section of our society. The Liberal Party has created the first ever national housing strategy, as I said before. This will help to reduce chronic homelessness by 50%. Our national housing strategy will, will be meeting the needs specifically of seniors, women, and children fleeing from violence, our indigenous people, people with disabilities, those dealing with mental health and addiction issues, veterans and young adults. To address veterans' homelessness, we will move forward with building new accessible and affordable housing units with a full range of health, social and employment supports for veterans who need extra help. The Liberal Party continues to invest in our people and our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Homelessness is a, a very complex issue and it must uh, take many factors into account. Firstly, I do believe we need to get our own federal finances in order so we can help the most vulnerable here. We need to incentivize builders to make high quality, affordable housing. Unfortunately, part of the homelessness problem is also psychological and we need to invest more in helping those with mental health issues and addictions. Eliminating homelessness will be expensive but it is a very worthy goal. During my tenure at Barry City Council, this is something we addressed and looked at seriously. In 2016, we built 121 new affordable units. In 2018, we built 320 new affordable units for a total of 441. And our target by 2024 was 840 units. I would bring that same determination, same work ethic to the Conservative Party and to Ottawa, and we need to work hard together with municipalities, with provinces to end homelessness across Canada. Will the NDP recognize homelessness as a violation of human rights? Yes, of course, housing is a human right. Everyone should have their needs taken care of. That needs to be the priority of a government. 
A core component of our approach to homelessness is enshrining the right of housing and law and starting work now with the goal of ending homelessness in Canada within a decade. We need to have the courage and meaningful action to build a Canada without poverty, where all Canadians can count on quality public services and community supports to help them lead dignified lives. Our affordable housing strategy will include measures to support Canadians at risk of becoming homeless. Take the lead from communities about local needs and adopt a housing first approach. To help people find the affordable home in the long term, we will support the creation of more social housing and other affordable options. And we will also end the austerity that has been brought in by Liberals and Conservatives by expanding health care and other services that all Canadians need and rely on. Thank you. Homelessness has been a problem in Canada for far too long. Our strategy must prioritize clean, safe, and affordable housing. We must provide supportive assistance to those with mental health and addiction issues rather than the judgmental approach that is too often taken by bureaucratic government agencies. Ending homelessness is a complex problem, but the real problem is that it is given a low priority and few people want to take the responsibility to solve a problem that gets little attention. I started a social business in Haiti, a country which has been ranked by the World Bank as the 10th most difficult place in the world to do business. I'm used to dealing with complex problems in difficult environments. The federal government can only play a coordinating role since social services are delivered by the provinces and municipalities. But strong leadership and coordination may be all that is necessary to solve this problem in Canada once and for all. I believe we can do far better than we are doing today. Keeping rents affordable by reducing immigration and stimulating construction will also help people on forced fixed incomes to afford clean, safe housing. Increasing supply of housing will mean that it is much easier to find a place to live since landlords will compete to get tenants rather than the other way around. Thank you. Um, one thing we would do is eliminate the first time home buyers grant, recognizing it is a, uh, a, an, a an effort to buy your vote. And what that would mean is it would drive up house prices. How does driving up house prices help people achieve home ownership? It doesn't make sense. The speculators would, would involve in that. And that's something we would oppose right away. That is a, um, a promise made in a, an election that doesn't make sense. We need to legislate housing as a legally protected fundamental right for all Canadians and permanent residents. We would increase national housing co-investment fund by 750 million for new builds and the Canadian housing benefit by 750 million for rent assistant for 125,000 households. And we need to be more creative. We need to work with co-ops. We need to work with uh, seniors who four or five of them want to get together and own a house. Um, we had a great talk up in Craighurst recently about this. And wouldn't it be wonderful if they could do that and maybe a nurse practitioner drop by every couple of weeks to check on their health and work on their preventative health care um, in a cooperative uh, ownership structure, which is difficult, but we need to change how we live. We have to find better ways to um, find housing, use the housing spaces that we have and make affordable options for everybody. Um, and that's one, one way that we discovered as a, as a possibility in Barry. So it's something we can work towards. Thank you. Does anybody want to make use of a rebuttal card? Okay, we are going to move to uh, our seventh question, and this one is on poverty and economy. And the question is, if elected, what will your party do to help low-income households meet their basic needs as well as be able to participate in their community? If your plan includes tax credits or cuts, who specifically will benefit and how? And what social programs, if any, will be cut? If your plan includes social programs, who will benefit and how? And how will you pay for them? And we're going to start with Doug. Thank you. Uh, 
<laughs> My team and I started campaigning back in June, and we've been to an astounding over 45,000 doors already. And by far the number one issue we're hearing about is affordability. Everybody is finding it tough. Day-to-day -to -day life is getting tougher for families, for people, for everyone. That's probably the number one issue. I think in some of the debates, we've all agreed we're hearing that a lot, that affordability is definitely an issue. Um, the Conservative Party and our platform, this whole campaign is based on making life more affordable for everyone. We know if times are tough, we want to put some more money back in your pockets. We want to do it by doing the simple things. We're not out to try and buy any votes. We're out to try and give away free vacations. We want to make sure everybody has a bit more money in their pocket. And some of the ways we want to do this is by scrapping the carbon tax and remove the GST from your home heating and energy bills. We will implement a universal tax cut and help the lowest earners most with $850. We will make parental benefits tax-free. We will provide tax credits for using public transit. We will bring back the child fitness, arts, and learning tax credits. Basic needs like food, clothing, housing must be affordable. We should be putting more money tax, more taxes on these items because they disproportionately affect most vulnerable Canadians. We are going to put more money back in all Canadians' pockets. We need to do better, and we need to do better right away. Previous governments have created a patchwork approach that has resulted in underfunded programs and left millions of Canadians living on the margins. People in our community should be thriving, not just surviving. We know that poverty and poor health are linked in a national pharmacare program will mean that all Canadians can access the prescription medicine they need regardless of their income or their address with their OHIP card. Better access to mental health and addiction support will also form a key part of our approach to tackling poverty and homelessness. We will develop a national child care program to lift families out of poverty and bring in a national school nutrition program so that no child enters the classroom hungry. People also need better wages and workplaces that are fair. So we will raise the floor for all workers by bringing in a $15 minimum wage for federal workers, raising that to a living wage. And we'll make sure those who work part-time or contract workers are compensated equally to full-time workers, make it easier for people to unionize. And unlike the Greens, who will bring in a guaranteed income scheme that eliminates key social programs and replaces them with a lump sum of cash, we will launch a basic income pilot project and make sure that the project does not affect the services people rely on. And it doesn't just subsidize corporations paying poverty wages. We will pay for all this by bringing in true tax fairness. We will raise corporate tax rates, close loopholes, and raise $70 billion by doing that over 10 years. Thank you. One thing the People's Party of Canada will do to make life more affordable for all Canadians is we will phase out the supply management system, which costs the average Canadian family three to $400 a year in increased grocery prices. It is unconscionable that none of the other parties are willing to stand up to the powerful dairy lobby that costs Canadians over $3 billion a year in increased prices. This costs the poorest families in Canada three to $400 a year, every family, everyone who buys dairy products, chicken or eggs. And none of these other parties will stand up to the dairy lobby. We will also increase the basic personal income tax exemption to $15,000. In addition, by cutting the business tax and eliminating the capital gains tax, we will stimulate investment and job creation. More people will have jobs and fewer will be dependent on welfare. Increased private investment will increase business productivity, which will further lower consumer prices. Reduced immigration will allow home construction to catch up with population growth, moderating growth in rental prices, and making homes more available and more affordable. Other, other parties make promises that cost tens of billions of dollars, and they have already put can can Canadians into hundreds of billions of dollars in debt while delivering only a small fraction of what they have promised. A People's Party government will reduce spending, balance the budget, and free the entrepreneurship of the private sector to solve our problems of poverty. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, <clears throat> listening as we're going across, carbon fee and dividend actually puts more money into the pockets of the poor. It puts more money into the pockets of the poor. That's what it's designed to do. You tax people that burn the carbon and you give it equally across everybody. Those at the bottom wind up ahead. It's a way to actually help the poor. And you said, we're not going to make um, sales pitches. And then you listed a number of tax credits. Tax credits for people who are in poverty? How does that work? Do they get taxes off the money that they're not getting because they're not working? It doesn't make any sense. Um, the other comment down the table was um, we were going to give a lump sum instead of all the other programs that exist. Yeah, a bigger lump sum to make it better. They do not get by on old age security, on ODSP, and the welfare system now, those people struggle every day. Every day they're not even close to the poverty line. So yes, they do need a bigger lump sum, as do all of us. I am, I can't read it. It's a quote by Martin Luther King. I am now convinced that the simplest approach will prove to be the most effective. The solution to poverty is to abolish it directly by a now widely discussed measure, the guaranteed income. Martin Luther King, 1967. Thank you. Our Liberal government is committed to act as a leader in the fight against poverty. The new opportunity for all plan is Canada's first ever national poverty reduction strategy bringing many of our policies and programs under one roof. The Child Care Benefit Plan introduced in 2016 is tax free income tested, targeting families who need it the most, low and middle income families. Thanks to our child care benefit, nine out of 10 Canadian families are receiving more help each month to pay for things like food, this has lifted more than 300,000 children out of poverty. We have also restored the age of eligibility for old age security from 65, <coughs> it used to be 67 from our conservative government. We continue to take action to help Canadians make ends meet. Thank you. Does anybody want to use a rebuttal card? Okay. Um, we're going to be moving to our audience questions. And uh, there has been a team that has been collecting your questions tonight and trying to create some questions for us. Oh, do I have to do a draw here? <laughs> okay. This is a, a question for every candidate, but we assume audience questions. All candidates would want to respond to. Do you believe that the percentage of seats awarded to each party should reflect the percentage of the popular vote by each party? If elected, will you support establishing a national citizens assembly with a mandate to develop such a voting system? And I think we could start it with Doug. So the first person, person will start is Dan. And on the audience questions, uh, we're going to just give you one minute and hopefully get through some questions. So one minute per responder. Okay, I think that's a, definitely a, a great question. And yes, the NDP does believe in proportional representation. And we will move towards proportional representation for the very next election. We will make sure that, uh, that we do uh, get to all parties together. So we work together to make sure that that system works. And after, after holding two votes that way, 
two general elections that way, we will hold a referendum so that people can see twice how this how proportional representation works, and then they can make an informed decision on whether or not they'd like to go back to first past the post, which I don't think will happen. <laughs> Thank you. I don't believe our party is supporting proportional representation or has the intention to introduce any reforms to the electoral the electoral system. I know the Liberals had proposed it and then did not implement it. I'm not sure why. There there may be more complications with it than we're aware. That's still something our party has not yet taken a position on, but as far as I know, we will not be implementing proportional representation. Thank you. Uh, the answer to the first part of the question is yes, absolutely. One of our six core values is participatory democracy. It is something that every vote needs to count. And when I win, the conservatives will be upset that their votes don't count. <laughs> because in our system, it does not work. Your vote doesn't count unless you vote for the winner in your riding, and unless that winner is part of a majority government. And you do not have a say, and those party politics prevent uh, that say from happening in your riding. So yes, our system is extremely flawed, and there was somebody four years ago promised 1,800 times across this country that he would change that system, and after a six-month committee that brought forward a consensus opinion, it was rejected, and denied, and he was heard saying to somebody, well, now that you got the party that you want, we don't need to change the system. And that is not how you do and lead government. You do not break your promise when you have a majority government. You can do it, and you have to do it. That's how you do government. With all due respect, we are a democratic government system. To have to do something does not speak about democracy. The Liberal government strongly believes in the role of Parliament and in public consultation in examining the issues of electoral reform. The Liberals' view has always been clear. Major reforms to electoral systems need to include the voices of our voting Canadians. That is why the Liberal government engaged in unprecedented dialogue with Canadians about democracy. While we couldn't come to consensus, we followed through the democratic way by involving our Canadians in the decision. Thank you. Thank you. At this point in time, it is not part of our platform to have electoral reform, but down the road, if there is a parliamentary committee that discusses it and do bring it forward, we would be willing to look at it, but it's not part of our platform right now. The next question, uh, it's a little easier to read and it's a little bit shorter, and it'll, we'll be starting with David on this one. Would you reverse the per per purchase of the pipeline? If yes, how would you do it? Yes, definitely. We would reverse the purchase of the pipeline, we would sell the pipeline, we would privatize it. Under a People's Party government, there would be no need for the government to own the pipeline because we would get the pipeline built. We would get jobs created in Alberta. We would get the pipeline built through Quebec and through British Columbia. We have a future that is based on clean energy, but we can't just jump there now. If we try and do that, that results in the loss of hundreds of thousands of jobs. We may not see it, but the people in Alberta, where they used to have the lowest unemployment rate in the country, are suffering. We cannot just magically create new technology. This is something that will take time. And for now, we need to build the pipelines to sell the pipeline. Thank you. Thank you. 
unfortunately, no, I wouldn't sell it. Um, we paid $5 billion to buy that 60 year old thing and it's ours and we're stuck with it. And we need to maintain it. We need to be responsible for when it leaks and if it does, and we need to clean it up when it happens. But I would not throw bad money, good money after bad, and invest an additional 15 billion, making it bigger. We do not agree to any new pipelines. We recognize that we need to scale down our fossil fuels, but that ship has sailed. That is ours and we own it and we're not gonna get value if we just give it to somebody else. We lose control and everything else. We have to be uh, pragmatic, I guess, in this situation. I didn't want it in the first place. Nobody asked that we wanted it in the first place. It wasn't uh, a conversation, it wasn't in promises four years ago. I don't know why we own it, but we do. So we have to deal with that and we have to move forward uh, owning something that uh, is going to be challenging. Apparently we're going to use the money we earned from that pipeline to pay for climate change. So we'll have to figure that one out. <laughs> Yes, we bought a pipeline. <laughs> the pipeline doesn't mean the world will be using more oil. It just means that Canada has better access to global markets. The emissions from the Trans Mountain expansion project are already included in our climate plan. Alberta has a hard cap on oil sand emissions, a global first. We're in transitions and the future of the energy industry will look very different than it does today. That's why every dollar the federal government earns from the Trans Mountain Expansion Project will go back into our energy transition. For example, planting two billion trees. Thank you. No, the Conservative Party would not sell the pipeline. We are for the pipeline. Uh, we agree, all agree there's an issue with the climate uh, crisis and we need to deal with that. But we want to make Canada more energy independent. Currently, we're buying hundreds of thousands of barrels from Saudi Arabia, uh, who has atrocious records of human rights. We would rather be supporting our own people, our own resources. We are going to keep the pipeline and we want to keep uh, Canada independent. Well, first off, climate leaders don't buy pipelines. Yes. Building pipelines means more oil out of the ground. Building refineries to, to refine that oil means that we're going to be using fossil fuels for years to come, perhaps even generations. Canadians now own a pipeline that may never get built. The decision to purchase wasn't brought to the people of our nation. There was no referendum. $4.5 billion was spent on a pipeline that may never get built. It's time for us to move to a green economy, and that time is now. Thank you. Yeah. I think we have time for one more audience uh, question before we move to closing remarks by our, our candidates. And this one, uh, Marty will be starting with this one, and this is, what is your opinion of nuclear waste burial beside our Great Lakes? <laughs> I'm a physics teacher and I've taught for 20 years about um, how nuclear uh, power plants work. I've talked about the value of uh, uranium and when people talk about the waste from nuclear power, they don't realize that that is warm. It is hot and that is energy. I would not bury potential energy. In Concarden, right near the Bruce Nuclear Power Plant, they use that energy for years to heat the uh, greenhouses nearby. It is not a uh, waste. It's, it's like burying all our plastic. That stuff's useful. It doesn't make sense to take an energy source and throw it away. We need to learn how to use it. It's not, um, as, as scary as you think. I, I, like I said, I have taught physics for 20 years and I understand uranium, nuclear power plants, the waste products. Um, no, I wouldn't bury it near the lakes. I wouldn't bury it anywhere. I'd find a way to use that energy. Thank you.
Thank you, Marty, for that response. We are all concerned about our waterways, our fresh water, and we are working very hard as a Liberal government to ensure that our fresh water is kept safe, especially with initiatives like the Great Lake Protective Initiatives. That also includes how that impacts our future generations, not just our present, to come. Our new Canadian water agencies will also work together to ensure that our waters are safe and that we can continue to move forward knowing that if we do have any buried waste, that we are protected. Thank you. Thank you to whoever brought up this question because it's an interesting question and I'm gonna give it to you straight. Uh, many times as a politician over the last nine years, I've been told I don't seem like a typical politician. Sometimes politicians feel like they have to know it all, make up answers. I don't have the answer to this question. So I would refer to Marty's answer, who appears to know much more about it than myself. But uh, if it's not good for the environment, of course I'm against it. But I can't sit here tonight and say whether I'm for or against something. Before I did the proper research on it, if it's going to harm people, harm the water, obviously I'm against it. But I can't sit here tonight and just make up an answer. So I would have to look into that a bit more. I hope you appreciate someone who just wanted to be honest tonight. Yeah. I guess I'm going to go with the same line there. I, 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 don't actually, I don't actually know where the nuclear waste is being buried, but I can tell you that uh, in, in my travels as a, as a union activist, uh, I have met people from the Power Generation Union and our Hydro One workers uh, that do work at some of these nuclear facilities. And I would entrust in them that they are disposing of this waste in a responsible manner. And if they weren't, I would entrust that they would be speaking up about it because they are activists and they're social justice fighters. Thank you. Thank you. When we talk about nuclear waste, I don't think we can ever talk about disposing of it. You don't just throw it in the ground and forget about it the way you do with other forms of waste. So when we talk about disposing of nuclear waste, we're talking about moving it from short-term storage, where it is now, to long-term storage. And from storage that is less safe to storage that is more safe. So evaluating that is going to depend on the scientists who do the geological studies, and that will determine how safe the storage is in whatever location it is. And we never can just throw it away. We have to monitor it. We have to have emergency plans in place for any eventuality like water inundation. We saw what happened with the Fukushima reactor in Japan. That can't happen to a nuclear waste facility in Canada. We have to monitor it, we have to have emergency response plans in place, and it has to be going from a place where it is less safe to a place where it is more safe. Thank you. Thank you. Given the mostly succinct answers we got on the last question, we're gonna squeeze in one more. <laughs> what is the federal government going to do regarding increased and complex pressures on social services? And we would start with Brian, I think, on this one. Again, one minute. What's very important to our Liberal government is ensuring the success of each and every one of our Canadians. We are investing to make sure that our children have a better opportunity in the future. And that's why, for example, our child care benefit plan has lifted 300,000 children out of poverty. And that's why we look to our seniors who have worked so very hard to build our country to where it is today. And we have reversed the old age security from 67 back to 65. We're also planning to increase by 10% the old age security once you reach 75 years of age. All of this is going to be helping our community, our social services, to make sure that we look after each other. <laughs> 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 
to be a Canadian, to be a proud Canadian, really means that we all respect and, and admire our social services. That really brings us all together as Canadians. I think we can agree on that, I hope. Uh, it is extremely important to make sure those are kept intact and kept going. Um, our leader, Andrew Scheer, has put forward a written guarantee promise that he will keep transfer payments to the provinces for those important social fabric network to be the same or minimum 3% more transfers going forward. Depending on if you require more, that's what he's saying is the minimum increase 3%. They're important to keep them going. We'll make sure the transfer payments are there to keep those going forward. Thank you. Well, the NDP has a, a strong history of bringing in our social services. Um, and what's been concerning is that in, in some provinces, like ours, uh, the governments have been making cuts to things like education and healthcare. These are social services we all need and rely upon. The NDP will always stand up for our public services because that's what they are. They're for the public good. We will also be expanding them by introducing our universal pharmacare plan, dental care, vision, and access to mental health and addiction services. Thank you. Making social services sustainable is not just a matter of spending more money when we already have a $28 billion deficit. <coughs> We're over $300 billion in debt. We need to make our social services sustainable for the future, and the way we do that is we increase the productivity of our economy and we reduce consumer prices. We create jobs so that more people are paying taxes. And we increase productivity, which reduces consumer prices. <coughs> then we can reduce taxes, and the provinces then have a larger tax base from which to sustain their social services. Social services are primar primarily a provincial responsibility that the People's Party will actually get out of providing certain social services such as healthcare. We want to transfer that completely to the provinces. We will transfer the tax credits to them so that they will be able to do it and they will be able to be more innovative in the way they deliver those services. Right now it's two levels and that's one too many. Thank, yeah, thank you. you. There's a word that's uh, became a dirty word and it's tax. Tax is our message to each other that we have caring and responsibility to each other in Canada. It's what we put into the system to make sure the system's in place for our neighbors, for our family, for our friends, and that is our social network, that's our social fiber. We need to put that word um, back in the mindset of this is how we take care of ourselves and how we take care of each other. Um, the Green Party is a fully costed plan. We take it to the parliamentary budgetary officer to make sure that we were fiscally responsible to deliver our fully funded pharmacare, all the efforts that we want to do around uh, tuition. Every dollar that we plan to spend is, is taken care of and we recognize healthcare is a number one issue head to toe. That is our social fabric makes us proud to be Canadians and we need to make sure that happens. We need to pay for that and that's a good word. Thank you. We are we're now going to ask our candidates to give closing remarks and that's going to be two minutes each and we're going to go in the reverse order from the introductions uh, that they that was started with so I'm going to ask first of all that David start uh, with closing remarks. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank uh, the organizers again and thank all of you for coming. For the entire history of Canada, only two political parties have ever held power, the Liberals and the Conservatives. I believe that the People's Party of Canada will be the first new party in over 150 years to eventually form the government of Canada. Because our party is not corrupt and we have honest, realistic policies that benefit all communities. Our leader, Maxime Bernier, is the only party leader who has extensive real-world experience. He worked for more than 20 years in the private sector before entering politics. He has worked for the Securities Commission of Quebec as a Vice President of Standard Life and as Executive Vice President of the Montreal Economic Institute. 
The leaders of our two main political parties, on the other hand, have little real-world experience. Trudeau was a ski instructor and drama teacher. <laughs> Scheer was a waiter and an insurance clerk for less than a year. Weak leaders are easily controlled by special interest groups. They also prevent their elected members from speaking freely so that these special interests can then control the entire government. The People's Party allows its members to say what they think and to have a free vote on issues according to what they believe in. As your representative, I will not be a puppet for the powerful. I will represent you, the people of Barry Springwater or Omadati. I will represent your interests, and I will represent the interests of all Canadians. Thank you. Thank you all again for joining us tonight for this important discussion. We are very fortunate to live in a robust democracy and we should all be thankful for that. For years and years, we have gone back and forth from the Liberals to the Conservatives. And life keeps on getting tougher for everyday people. These people are the working poor, they are the working class, they are medium and small sized business owners, they are our friends and our families. It's time we had a government that looks after you, not their big business buddies and wealthy insiders. An NDP government will stand up for everyday Canadians because we are in it for you. Now, the NDP has never formed government, but through leaders like Tommy Douglas, we have been able to accomplish great things. Social programs like employment insurance, the, the Canada Pension Plan, of course, universal health care. Just imagine what we could accomplish if the NDP formed government. We could fulfill Tommy's dream of head-to-toe health care. We could tackle the climate crisis while addressing systemic issues in our society like racism and inequality. I'm asking for your vote because I'm ready to work hard for this community. I'm ready to make life more affordable, to improve the public services we all rely on, and to tackle the big global issues that we are all facing. I got involved in politics because I know that in my heart, I have something to offer my community. I know that if elected, I will be a strong representative for our riding because I am passionate about making life better for people. By sending me to Ottawa, I promise you that I will, you will be electing someone that will always be on your side. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've talked about, we've all talked about many issues tonight, many issues that are facing many Canadians, but there's one large looming issue that no one has talked about tonight, and that is our crushing national debt. And if we don't deal with that, we won't be able to deal with any of these issues because we're spending too much money on interest to service our debt. So I'd like to leave you with a quick story that I discussed at my last uh, debate that we had. We had an email come into our office uh, a few weeks ago from a, a doctor who's a doctor at RBH for palliative care. And the, and the doctor asked if someone from the Conservative Party could go see a gentleman who's at RBH in palliative care. So uh, my campaign manager who was here tonight quickly called me and I'm in the office and I called the doctor and I said, sure, what can I do to help? And they said, there's a gentleman in palliative care who'd like to speak to someone from the Conservative Party. So I dropped everything I was doing and I went. It was obviously a concern. I had no idea what I was walking into. Uh, this gentleman might have been upset over his health care, might have been upset with the Conservatives, but I went. And when I went in, I met this gentleman, his name was Antonio, and he was with his two grown um, grandchildren. And he, I introduced myself, and Antonio asked me, I said, how can I help you, sir? And he said, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to make sure you get elected, and the Conservative Party gets elected. He said, I am not comfortable leaving this country to my grandchildren the way it is right now. This crushing debt is not sustainable, and it won't be able to keep going on. He said, I can't leave knowing that this debt is such an insurmountable task. So when you start hearing stories like that, and I promised Antonio that day that I'd do whatever I could to help him with that, when you start hearing stories like that, that's their, on their, literally their deathbeds as a concern to him, that keeps us going every day. That will keep me going in uh, Parliament in Ottawa, knowing that people like that, it is a concern and we need to get out there and work hard. So like, uh, a vote for me will make sure that our crushing debt is hopefully dealt with over the next few years. Thank you.
thank you all for coming out today. And I have seen firsthand the struggles that our families are going through in this community. And that is why I was inspired to open Simcoe County's first ever nonprofit dental center. Like many of you, I also love walking around the bay. But the state of Lake Simcoe bothers me. I can't stand by and continue to watch it being destroyed. It reminds me of the murky, dark, chocolatey colored water that I've experienced firsthand as an international volunteer in developing countries. People would walk several miles, several times a day, because this was the only source of fresh water. Look, I want to invest in Canadians. I believe in our neighbors, I believe in our community, and I believe in this country. This election is important to Canada, but it's very important to Barry Springwater or Medante. The last federal election, this right was decided by a mere 86 votes. Not 3%, not 5%, 86 votes. What does that mean? That means each and every one of your votes matter. We need an MP for Barry Springwater or Madonna that is part of a team to advocate for social justice and pushes for climate action. One that is willing to invest in our economy, invest in our people. It's very important in this election, you choose a government that has a real plan. Choose forward. Choose Brian Kelly Charan. Thank you. Raise your hand if you were sitting here four years ago. <laughs> yeah. I was here too, and I was railing against the Stephen Harper changes, the cuts to our, the damage to our democracy, the Bill C-51, the firing of scientists, all the damage that he was doing to our country, and I was here and I was fighting for that four years ago. And I was actually excited. I was excited when there was a liberal government because they were saying everything I was saying. They were very good at it. The previous Brian said it very clearly, right out of my platform, was reading our policies. I was like, great, I don't even have to go, they're gonna do it. And then they didn't. And so I screamed at the TV, I screamed at the radio for the last four years. Every time they didn't do what they say that I said I was going to do. And that was very frustrating. Please read our fully costed plan. I know they have, they're reading from it, and they are saying the same lines that I've been saying. They've been putting the green paintbrush on, and they, they're doing it again. And the reason they're doing it, because it's different this time. It's different this time. Um, in this writing, the green is actually the intelligent, the progressive, the strategic vote. In this writing, if you do not want a majority government if you want a minority government that is forced to work together, to collaborate on issues, to create Canadian policies, Green is the progressive strategic vote in this riding. And I can tell you, it feels different this time. It feels different this time. It feels good. And it feels green. <laughs> that our candidates, they have tables out there where you're hoping that they will stay and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with you. We're offering some refreshments, so we hope that you will stay and have some fellowship with each other because after all, an election brings us together as neighbors. And it is really important that we uh, relate to each other as neighbors. Um, finally though, I would like all five of our guests tonight to, take, to stand up so that we can acknowledge <laughs>